This is the sermon podcast from First Christian Church of Kokomo, Indiana for November 13th, 2016. Our community of faith gathers each Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. for worship, and you will find us scattered throughout our community all week long seeking to live out the way of Jesus. We hope that you will find these words encouraging and meaningful. This week, Pastor William Jewsbury gives his thoughts on stories that shape us. Deb saved me a couple minutes there by reading the Psalm 23 and that version that I learned so long ago, that King James version that is still the one that is in my head. If I try to recite it from memory, which I can almost do, it always comes out in that version. Brian McLaren made an interesting observation in the chapter that we've been reading this week. He wrote this, he said, when Jesus healed people, He didn't tell them, I will save you, or my faith has saved you, but instead would say, your faith has saved you. Jesus looked at people, at individual people, at groups of people, at families and tribes and nations, and saw in them the stories that shaped their lives. And so it was their faith that he tried to activate. And like Deb said, we we all live in a sea of stories. I am the collection of my stories. I was one of the smallest kids in junior high, and I wasn't an athlete. And right there, that created some stories in who I was. Being bullied occasionally, not too badly, I can't complain, but never really being on that in crowd. On the other side of things, I was always the one who succeeded academically, and so I had that crowd to run with. They weren't as respected back then, but we had our own opportunities. And along the way, I discovered science fiction stories. I went through the entire series of Heinlein and Asimov and others and read voraciously in that and I think that created a story in my mind about what the future might be some of which we've discovered already and a lot of which is still out there the way my parents raised me was a part of my story and I recognized that as we began to raise our children some 35 years ago and began to see little things happening about how I was raised and how Marsha was raised that came out in how we raised our children. And in September, when we went out to visit our new grandson, Easton, we kind of watched in amazement as we saw those little things being done by Chad and Kate that we remember, that were our stories. I've studied extensively on church planning and process and how to be church, and yet, when I need to really figure out what happens next, my mind always goes back to how I was raised in church and what I saw adults do in church and elders do in church and other ministers do in church. It wasn't so much the books that I've read, they're important, but it's those stories that shape who I am and what I do that gain importance. My story is shaped over and over again by the stories of others. Listening to Jim this morning, and and, and I wasn't alive during World War II. I was born during Korean War, but I certainly remember Vietnam. And the the feeling of of pain and suffering and and dread since that was the first war that really became televised and we, we began to see it on a regular basis. And maybe that's why we were able to maybe forget Korea because it just wasn't quite as present in front of us. But Vietnam was. And I was shaped by the images of Vietnam, by the life and death of John F. Kennedy, by the teaching and death of Martin Luther King Jr., by all that happened during those formative years. But along the way, along the way, all of those stories that shaped me and who I am are seen through the lens of Scripture, 
I remember listening to Martin Luther King Jr. I was just, you know, I was just a kid, basically. I was 12 years old, 13 years old, but then I began to hear his sermons when I got older. I began to look them up. And that connected me back to the stories of Exodus and liberation that we've been reading these last few weeks. It made it real for me as, as we saw a people in our midst say, how can we also be liberated and be made whole once again? Those wars of the 50s and 60s, Korea and Vietnam and the ones around them, take us back to those wars in Bible times as tribes struggled for land and power and authority and people wrestled with the meaning of life through war rather than through conversation and discussion. And then, of course, that was that, there was that important moment when we landed on the moon. Such a, an important moment for those of us wrapped up in science fiction mythology and thinking. And I still have an image in my mind of those pictures sent back from the moon of the earth off there in the distance that, as Carl Sagan called it, the little blue marble. You know, that little blue marble out in space and how that began to change our understanding of heaven and earth and what it meant to be a part of a universe. Those stories shape us. And we go to the Bible and we look at those stories and say, how do those help us understand our story today? And if any of us were to ponder our life stories, and I'm sure some of you do from time to time, we would find so many different intertwined stories of meeting people at the right time who helped us move forward, of opportunities grasped and those that we let disappear, of words and images that still shape us today, even after 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 years of life. As I looked at the lessons for today, I realized I had to choose one. I had to choose one lesson to use as our, as our story, the story that we will use to inform what we talk about today. And I chose Psalm 23, and you've already heard Deb give a good sense of that to the children. Most of the time we think of Psalm 23 when we're in the midst of grief or loss, the loss of a loved one, a parent, a spouse, a mentor, a friend. And some of those losses are very gentle. We can go to a funeral service as someone who has aged gracefully slips away at the end of life and we can offer a blessing to God and say, thank you God for a life well lived. But far too often those losses are jarring. They're losses that just surprise us and startle us. We remarked a couple weeks ago about the Nass family losing their 14-year-old son. Suddenly we read reports of shooting deaths that occur far too often in our large cities and the losses that accompany those, and they startle us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Other stories don't simply shape us, they scar us. I shared earlier this fall about the conversations on race that a number of us were a part of at, down at the Bind Cafe here in Kokomo. And for those of us who are here today, the racial divide that has long plagued our nation is somewhat theoretical. We don't experience it on a day-to-day -day basis. But for black and Hispanic men and women who joined in that discussion, it's an everyday reality. 
And I appreciate it that Jim made note that Korea was kind of the first war where we began to actually integrate our troops. And the military in many ways has led us into integration as we fought it every inch of the way in parts of our nation. And yet, those racial divides and the, the scarring that comes when people fight in war, we, we, we have a name for it now. We call it post-traumatic stress syndrome, but we've known about it for years. We used to just simply call it shell shock. People who are so deeply affected by seminal moments that impact them. And they are scarred. And their stories are never the same again. On Wednesday, a, a friend of mine, a young African-American woman who's on the staff of one of our church offices in Indianapolis, posted on Facebook a story of her husband being approached in Indianapolis, and here's what she wrote. She says, it's deeper than the presidency, it's about schools and the state of education, it's about people having access, it's about the encounter with hate my husband had just this morning, fools yelling at him, we won, and then ending with the N-word at a stoplight. All this week, I think all of us have had a bit of churning in our stomachs. We've watched protests on college campuses and some of them even turning violent. We've read of random acts of hate and abuse. That one was far too close for me that are the aftermath of this all too tense election. And whether you're overjoyed by the election or deeply sad isn't the issue here. It's how do, this, do these stories shape us? Who are we now going forward from this time? The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He lets me rest in grassy meadows. He leads me to restful waters. He keeps me alive. He guides me in proper paths for the sake of his good name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no danger because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they protect me. You set a table for me right in front of my enemies. You bathe my head in oil. My cup is so full it spills over. Yes, goodness and faithful love will pursue me all the days of my life, and I will live in the Lord's house as long as I live. But I realized as I tried to listen to the stories in my life in these weeks and through life, that it's not just at times of death or at fear that we connect our stories to scripture. There's a lot of other stories that shape us. Wednesday night at uh, choir practice, we were celebrating with uh, Ann and Eric. Ann was there to celebrate with, Eric wasn't, about a new grandchild. And my mind began to think, wow, we've had a lot of those. Jill and Terry celebrate a new grandchild, and Nancy and Carl do, and Marcia and I, and, and uh, several, who's had a new grandchild this year? Get a hand up there. Okay, there, okay, yeah, okay, most, I got most of them then, I caught pretty well. Great grandchild, great grandchild down there for Helen. Uh, a friend of mine, a Methodist pastor that has been a good friend for about 30 years, posted twins, you know, twin grandchildren, twin boys, and his celebration, he wrote this wonderful post about the celebration of life that he was experiencing being renewed again by these grandchildren. And so we need to remember that it's stories of hope and stories of joy that also connect in our lives and bring us back to Scripture. In the message version, God, my shepherd, I don't need a thing. You have bedded me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and you send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I'm not afraid. When you walk at my side, your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my drooping head, my cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. We turn to the Bible for ideas, to establish our beliefs, to figure out the rituals of church, and so much more. 
But more importantly, we turn to the Bible to make sense of our stories, of what's happening to us in our lives. We ask questions, where is God in this moment of my life? Where is God leading me? How will I get through this time in my life? How do I make sense of what is happening? Our stories shape us. And our stories only make sense to us when we're able to bounce them off of other stories and inform ourselves, those family stories and those national stories and those stories that come out of heritage and scripture and so much more. That's when our stories begin to make sense. I'm going to invite Cindy to return back up to the organ bench and she's going to play the tune to The Lord is My Shepherd. It's called Brother James Eyre. And as she does, I want to invite you to close your eyes, if you're willing, and reflect on your story right now. It may be a story of great joy. It may be one of pain. It may be a story that you aren't really sure how to shape it yet because right now you aren't sure what's going on. You're a little bit bored or depressed and, and that is a story in itself. And so take your time as she plays and seek God in your story. Let us be in silence. my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Amen. As we consider our stories, we always offer the...